last lesson of this first unit for credit recovery world history we're going to be looking at ancient egypt so it's worth noting that this civilization of ancient egypt has been a lot longer we've been around a lot longer than the other ones we've talked about and when you watch about anything about ancient egypt it's really coming from one set area so i'll talk about that more as we go but as always we're looking for causes and effects that make up world history in this case we're looking at what did people use early man use to settle in one area what from the environment so that's what we're looking for but more hyper focused on ancient egypt so getting into it what do you need to know you need to know its location this is in or on the continent of africa this is the mediterranean sea and then italy somewhere up here so why this is all important is because it's all next to water and if you haven't picked up on it water is kind of a big lifeline for early man so we actually break their history up into three separate areas the old kingdom the middle kingdom and the new kingdom so reason being is that there's a lot of historical things that happen in those different sections and you're going to notice that their government is going to be mostly like what we talked about with other ones with a monarchy so and that's where these kingdoms are going to come back in is that pharaohs inside of each of these kingdoms are going to basically mold their future if you will but you notice there's a big river running right here and it's called the nile so you're going to hear a lot about that in this presentation so going into the first kingdom the old kingdom you're going to notice the time span here about 500 ish years so this one section by oops, sorry this one section by itself is older than the united states and it's been around longer than the united states but this is really where you see a lot of pyramids start popping up so these are rocks that they got from the earth moved on the the nile river and they had a couple of different functions the most notable function is going to be the tombs for pharaohs to be buried in so imagine the amount of love that they had or the fear that they had for their leaders that they are going to build these massive structures for them so here is the og if you will one of the very first ones oops that gave us the most notable pyramid so this is khufu so he is such a big deal is because he's going to be like the the george washington of pharaohs if you will he's going to be the one that kind of set the standard so he is going to be responsible for the great pyramid of giza which is right there in the middle so when you look at this it's going to be over two million blocks of stone that are from rocks that are not from the area which meant they had to move a long way to get there it's actually one of the wonders of the world because people don't really know how they were built. I mean, human beings obviously built it, but whether it was slaves or not is going to be on the next slide. But again, he basically defined the role of what a pharaoh should do, and he gave this order. So he's actually in the middle one right there if you really want to get specific. But like I was saying before, how are these pyramids built? And if you look at Egypt as a whole, they're everywhere. Okay, So this is the city of Cairo. The Great Pyramids are just off of them off of the city line and that's pretty dang impressive in that they're still around today so historians will debate will debate all the time whether or not these were built by slaves or not and you can make an argument for yes or for no and that's not really the point of this but the point of this is is that they use the earth to make stuff like this so that's kind of why this is a big deal so another thing that's made out of a environmental factor is a thing called the sphinx which is i'm sorry i'll get this down before i know it but is the sphinx which is a ginormous structure that looks like a cat with a man's face so nobody really knows what it's for but it's got tunnels that lead into it they found boats that were buried in front of it it's got a tail i mean it's pretty dang cool it doesn't have a nose but you know whatever it's old but why this is all kind of a big deal is that this is also one of the wonders of the world of just like what the crap is this thing so first question true or false the egyptians used environmental factors in the old kingdom so going into the middle kingdom you're going to notice that this is sorry where... could you say that yep nope, sorry sorry not that but you're going to notice that during this time is when the culture of ancient egypt is really going to start cranking up and this is where we're going to find some of the stuff that's been written on walls some of the jewelry that's still going to be around but more importantly history wise sorry 
is this is where Egypt is going to become unified. So similar to Mesopotamia in this valley, there's going to be different pockets of people around the Nile. But this is where they're going to start unifying, like north and south kingdoms, if you really want to get into the hard cores of it. But here's where you're going to notice different stuff from the earth, gold, copper, gems. This fancy stone called purple amethyst is going to start appearing inside of their culture, if you will. And we notice that they hunt cranes along the, the Nile, and they actually kind of bred them at one point. But again, this is kind of a big deal. And all the while, they're building up their armies. Because as we've kind of talked about before, all these natural resources, there's only a few of them. So therefore, some civilizations are actually going to go to war with other civilizations to who can have total control. And then we have the New Kingdom. This is most likely where you will take your mind on a lot of the stuff that you see of ancient Egypt. And arguably, this is where the most famous of the pharaohs came about. But again, you notice the time span, 500-ish years. That's still longer than what the United States has ever existed. And it got to be at the height of its power because of its awesome military. And after a time, the military would win. They'd build these things called obelisks that would depict the battle stories or the war stories, if you will. And these are all over. And we actually like this design so much that we actually stole the idea. We made it into what's known as the Washington Monument. So, kind of cool. And here are those rulers that we we're talking about. So the first one that's worth noting is Pharaoh Hatshepsut. She is and I said she, is the first female ruler of Egypt. So whenever she would meet foreign leaders or outside of Egypt, she actually wore a fake beard just so people would respect her. And then you fast forward a couple of decades, and then you're going to have Ramses II. He is going to be the longest serving pharaoh. The fact that he served for 60 years past his age, obviously, probably like 70-ish, is an amazing feat in itself because Old age was a luxury back then. People did not live very long back in the day. But as known as a huge military leader, and that's how they got to be so dang big. But the person that is most known in ancient Egypt is King Tut. And what's really interesting about him is that he did not do a whole lot. So he is most famous because we found his tomb completely intact. That's the only real reason. It wasn't his actions from when he was alive. It's he was really good at being dead. So Howard Carter, the guy that found him, found this completely 100% intact, took notes, took pictures, took all the fun stuff inside, and we could finally figure out exactly how people viewed their pharaohs back in the day. And that's it. That's the only reason why he's really important. There was basically written about during the time period that he had a tomb curse he really didn't newspapers reporter made it. new newspaper reporters made it up but if you notice this is his burial mask this is 130 pounds of pure gold so that is a natural resource environmental factor if you will and this is priceless i mean the amount of stones and stuff on there but you can see this in the louvre in paris if you really want to go check it out but it's still pretty dang cool so here's my question for you. True or false? The Egyptians used the environmental factors during the Middle and Old Kingdoms. So going into the daily life of an Egyptian, okay? So if we were around during the time, what would our life be like? This, you have to kind of keep in perspective that gender roles are still very thick. So it may not have always been like this, but most likely this is what it was like for commoners. Okay? One, only the wealthy people could afford to send people to school. Everybody else had to work in order to live, okay? How are they living? They're hunting, they're fishing, they're farming, whichever, along the Nile, okay? So most things that you could grow, they grew it. They had a very tremendous food supply. That's why they thrived for so long, okay? If you were to add up all the years of the kingdoms of the ancient Egypt, it's like five or six times as long as the United States has been around. It's ridiculous. Okay, they're really good at growing crops such as cotton and that they turn into linens and clothes. Only the really rich could afford to dye their clothes. So most people just wore white. Okay, most people couldn't afford jewelry. However, some people did to kind of glam themselves up. So they had a culture. This is also the, one of the first civilizations to use mud as bricks. So take a whole heap of mud. Let it, let it in the sun, let it kind of bake there, and then you do that enough times, you can build up a structure that's pretty solid. And then women getting married at 12, yeah, that's that's what they did. It's just what it was. 
So the Egyptians used which environmental factors in their daily lives? And then the writing. So this is probably what you know from ancient Egypt the best. They're hieroglyphics. So this is a form of picture writing. This is kind of like using emojis, but way before they were on cell phones and cool. So their hieroglyphics actually represent a sound of the voice in their language. So that's why there's over 750. And it took us forever how to figure out how to read this stuff. Okay, but I'm going to show you how we did here in a little bit. And not only were they the first to come up with one of the major written languages, but they're also the first people to come up with paper. And it looks like this. This is papyrus. This is a plant that what they would do is they'd get it wet and they'd produce like this milky substance and they'd press it between rocks to make it one flat sheet of paper. And then obviously as it dried, it rolled up, but it was what it was. But writing things down on paper is a game changer in mankind. And this is how we figured out how what their language was or how their hieroglyphics read, is we thought it was originally lost. But the French Foreign Legion in the 1700s-ish, early 1800s-ish, I can't remember exactly off the top of my head, found this rock. And they found that the top was written in hieroglyphics. The middle is actually in their other written language called demonic, which is sounds demented, but it's their official alphabet if you want to go that route. And on the bottom is the Greek language that they still use today. So we knew how to read the middle one and we knew how to read the bottom one and they said the same thing. So people actually sat down and figured out what the hieroglyphics meant. And this was kind of like the decoder pin of it, if you will, all found by complete accident, but worked out better for us. So here's the question for you. The Egyptians use which environmental factor in making paper? <laughs> 